So please uh, uh, welcome Constantine Bayer. He's a PhD student uh, at Oxford and did his bachelor um, studies in Vienna University of Düsseldorf. That is correct. Um, and then did a master's in mathematical and theoretical physics. Yes. And is now currently working with uh, Gina Grigori and Sophia Sarka in Oxford. Um, we had just uh, Professor Grigori here. Yeah. Um, and he's going to talk to us about something that's on there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I mean, the main body of the talk will be more or less introductory because I was told that no one here actually does this sort of stuff. So I figured it would be better, uh, you know, to go through like you know the beginnings of this sort of thing, like have like a short introduction, talk a bit about experiments because okay, Gianluca does a lot of experiments, so you know my group is very experimental, so we will not really get around this. Um, the first thing to mention is I I am a PhD student in this group. I just recently started, so most of the stuff I'm going to be presenting about was actually done by these people. Um, you know, I mean credit to all of them. If I'm going to say anything which is wrong, I mean, it's on me, you know, not on them, so just to put that out there. Um, right, so, I mean, I already mentioned that for a tiny bit, but what we're going to talk about today is cosmic rays. Um, we will state the, the problems we still have about them, so cosmic rays is not a solved problem. There are still some, you know, ideas which need to be make, made, some... Uh, um, was that a question? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, we will then go over basically make the connection from here to there um, because the like, main theory of accelerating particles to higher energies was developed by Fermi. Um, he proposed some mechanisms to actually do that. Um, we will find that these mechanisms rely on basically two ingredients in the universe one of them is turbulence the other one is magnetic fields we will discuss both of them very briefly um, and then the big field where experiments from Gianluca and also experiments which might be able to measure um, particle acceleration come in is this magnetic field point so we will discuss the origin of these magnetic fields um, look at mechanisms that play a role there and then discuss some of the experiments and some of the changes to these experiments which might be able to, to measure um, well, yeah, particle acceleration. I'm saying might because that's kind of the thing that we want to find out if it's possible or not. And of course, like every time in physics, the answer is, well, maybe. We don't really know. But uh, yeah. So first of all, what are cosmic rays? Well, we know that cosmic rays exist like more than a, since more than a century ago. Um, there was a guy called uh, Victor Hess, it's him here. And uh, what he did is he basically measured the conductivity of air in a balloon. So he went up, like went further away from, from the surface of the earth and tried to figure out if, if the conductivity changes because that gives you a handle of, um, well, yeah rays, like particles, for example, from alpha, uh, alpha particles, beta particles, and this sort of stuff, because what they believed in, in that time is that most of these come from the surface of the Earth. So his idea was the higher he goes, he will find less and less of these particles, but he didn't. He actually, you know, he, he didn't find this decrease which he expected, so there was an interesting, interesting thing happening there. And then he did some more of these flights, and you know, like, the different areas, the different times of the day, and this sort of stuff. And um, he concluded that there must be another source of radiation coming from above, as he said. Well, that's from space. Um, he managed to exclude the sun as a source, because he just flew during the night. Um, and that sparked a few questions for all sorts of people. Well, where do these come from? What is this radiation actually? And how does this acceleration, uh, no, this uh, radiation get accelerated? Yeah. Today, this spectrum of radiation is quite well known. There are a, a series of, of uh, experiments that measure this, this sort of stuff. Um, 
we can see that this basically shows the energy of the particles compared to the rate at which they arrive at, at, uh, at, at the Earth. And we can see that there's a huge range. Um, there are particles which are fairly low energetic, but there are also particles which are really high energetic. So it goes up to 10 to the 11 GeVs per particle, so really high energetic. As a comparison, the LHC is somewhere here, so it's really like orders of magnitudes higher energy. And um, the question is, where do these particles come from? You start with the scales. With the LHC measured in 10, maybe it's uh, uh, Yeah, that's actually true. Maybe it's the old energy. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. I only took this picture from somewhere. I mean, it could be wrong. Um, Whatever, I mean, <laughs> depend, no, no matter of that, they are extremely high energetic particles. And um, we try to basically look at different astrophysical objects, which could be sources of this radiation. And what people do is they draw this Hillis plot. The Hillis plot, in a sense, is a comparison of the most energy you can get out of a specific source by comparing its magnetic field and its um, magnetic field and its um, well, source size under considerations of inner movements and this sort of stuff but in a sense they compare that and then they they find a maximum energy and um, as you can see like everything above this this solid line is responsible for for like these high energetic energetic particles and there is nothing we, we don't really know of any source yet, so that's an open question. Um, but the thing we can do is, today we, we get into the regimes where probably also laser-produced plasmas, so laboratory plasmas can accelerate particles, and that will give us a handle on you know measuring some of the properties and understanding the mechanism a bit better to you know, maybe fill up this plot or understand some of the rest. Um, just a very short short slide, what, how, how do we measure these particles? This is the, the ice cube experiment at the South Pole. And essentially what happens is a particle comes in, scatters off some particle in, in the atmosphere, produces a shower of particle, this shower gets measured. And then from um, collecting all this data, we can infer back the energy and also the, the, the particle type which, which came in and this sort of stuff, so that's how it how it gets measured. Um, now, how do these particles get, uh, get accelerated? Because, I mean, they are very fast. They have very high energies. Um, and the idea for the acceleration mechanism comes from Fermi. Here he is. Um, he published a series of paper, actually, but the first one in 1949. And there his idea was that these particles collide with magnetized clouds, whatever magnetized clouds are, but they, they collide with those, and then they get stochastically accelerated because depending on if they you know collide head on or, or from the tail, they gain or lose energy, and then you can make some arguments, which we will have in a second, that they actually gain energy. And that's a second order process in, in the velocity of the scattering agent over the velocity of the, of the particle. Um, and then people started thinking about what these magnetized clouds are, because that's kind of something that you know, doesn't really make sense. And it was found that magnetized clouds, in a sense, can be plasma waves, for example. So there are actually entities which can cause this sort of scattering event. Um, and then in 1954, Fermi just modified this, this idea by essentially introducing not one magnetized cloud, but two. So two magnetic mirrors, which converge onto each other. And that enhances the, the whole um, scattering, well, it enhances the scattering rate because now particles just bounce back and forward, gaining energy at every single scattering event. And this renders it to, to a first order process because you just, you know, you gain the rate, which, which is basically determined by the crossing time of a particle. So that's one more factor in V. Um, the interesting mechanism which um, we will be talking about, because that's the one which might be measurable in, in uh, experiments, is second-order Fermi acceleration. 
And um, the way it works is, is the following. Um, you have this magnetized cloud, or plasma wave, or whatever you want, and you have a particle. And um, these two collide. If it's a head-on collision, then by just you know, changing reference frames twice and doing a scattering in there, you see that energy is gained. If it's a tail collision, energy is lost. Um, now, if you go into, into the, the, the frame of, of the, the charged particle, whatever it is, in our case, it would be a proton, then um, you will, you will find that, in a sense, head-on collision and, and uh, like tail collision are pretty much the same, and the only parameter that goes in is the relative velocity between the two. So the probability for a scattering event is proportional to the relative velocity. And if you then look at a like, normal plasma distribution, which is a Maxwellian distribution, you find that um, there are more particles which are slower and get accelerated, and there are particles which are faster and get decelerated. So on average, you will find an acceleration. And this acceleration is stochastic because you get all these scattering events in which you know it just goes back and forth. Now, the two ingredients we, we need in order to claim that Fermi acceleration actually happens in the universe is um, turbulence. And there has been work done um, by people who have made simulations about structure formation. And um, they, they have found that you know, when, when these clusters merge and like, the gas, gas actually, actually like, falls onto each other, um, and these, these like, filaments form from which then you know, galaxies and, and all the matter we see, which we see forms, um, there are shocks driven by this acc accretion. And this shock, these shocks basically introduce vorticity, like, like seen here. And vorticity then introduces um, turbulence and this sort of stuff. So there is evidence from uh, simulations that the universe is actually overall pretty turbulent. So that's good. Do those um, yeah. simulations involve uh, dark matter? Is, is this the structure formation, or is this just entirely? Um, the, the ones I read about, definitely not. Mm. I cannot tell you if there are any like more recent ones which do. Probably yes, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I have no idea about this. So I mean, these yeah. ones definitely not. Yeah. yeah. But okay. there yeah. might be some. Yeah. I don't know. Um, the second thing which which is important is well, magnetic field, magnetization. Um, just a very short slide, this, this, this can be measured. You can basically use Faraday rotation. So if you have like a light like a photon coming in and it just undergoes like through a region of magnetic field, the polarization will, will, will turn a bit and this can be measured. And um, people have done that and they have inferred that on average the universe is magnetized. Not very strongly, but it is magnetized. And this sparked um, a, a very interesting question and the question is why is it actually magnetized because if we just look at the induction law which is this then um, if we choose like a big t0 just a time in the beginning and we say that we don't really have any reason to believe that in the beginning there should have been any magnetic field so let's just set it to zero then just based on this equation the magnetic field will always stay zero so it will never like spontaneously form. Um, that must be wrong because we see magnetic fields in the universe as just as just discussed. So, um, well, luckily there are some, uh, basically a whole catalog of loads of plasma processes which come to the rescue and explain a way on how you can modify this equation to add a, like a seed to, to, to the whole thing. Um, some of them are B1 battery, which will be the important one we're going to talk about, but there are also viable instabilities or even more exotic ones like interaction with number goldstone scalars, like axions and, and all this sort of stuff. There are like a load, loads of things which, which can be tested for. Um, Biermann battery seems to be the one which is operating, well, at least definitely in the experiments which were done, but also like in, in simulations which, which have been made. And what Biermann battery does is it adds this seed 
seed term to um, the induction law and this seed term basically creates magnetic fields if the pressure gradient and the density gradient are not aligned. If they're aligned, it's zero, but if they're not, then suddenly, even if these are zero, magnetic fields form. So that's a seed mechanism. And um, that has been tested for. There were very early um, simulations, which again, probably did not include dark matter, I'm fairly certain. Um, that have tested for that by just taking a regular structure formation um, code, which did not involve any magnetic fields at all, and just testing for each step if you know this gradient, these two gradients are aligned or not, and then you know just seeing if these magnetic fields actually spark, and they do. Um, they found that well, it was basically 100% correlated to the density, so denser regions, you know, they, they had more seeds than, than voids and this sort of stuff. But there is definitely a seed. So it's, it's gravitational effects which are causing a difference in density, which is basically giving them this... this yes, and then, you know, turbulence starts to like, misalign these, these mm. things and all that. And so, yeah, okay. exactly. Um, Exactly. And then recently there have been experiments made which, in a sense, just just well, prove this right. They uh, find that magnetic fields, well, they find an enhancement in the magnetic field, but that's because there is an outer magnetic field from the laser and this sort of stuff, so they find seed fields. And they also um, well, claim that they are of the same order th uh, as, as found here. And we can see that 10 to the minus 21 Gauss is really small. So we find seed fields, but they are extremely small. Um, so that sparks the next question. We've seen that the, magnetic, uh, the universe is magnetized, not very strongly, but definitely more than that. And again, plasma physics comes to the rescue because if there is turbulence in, in this system and the system is a highly conducting system, which a plasma is, then MHD, the MHD equations basically tell you that your magnetic field is frozen in the flow. So each each um, fluid element has its own magnetic field attached to it, and when it moves, the magnetic field moves as well. Um, for an infinitely conducting medium, I mean, if it's not infinitely conducting, then you know there's some some deviation. But you, you, the, the the picture is good. And then what happens is the same thing as you can do with a rubber band. You just you know stretch it, you curl it, you fold it, you do all these sort of things, and in the end you have a rubber band which is tangled up, but it's probably going to be stronger than before because you know there are loops in it and this sort of stuff. And that's what, what also happens here because turbulent movement is just random movement. So if this, this you know, field just moves around randomly, that's what happens. A nice cartoon, you, you can see it very well here. And um, that has again been measured very recently um, well, I mean last year, but the paper came out this year. And this is the experiment we're going to be talking about in a second. The only thing I wanted to mention is because I didn't know about that before well, starting to work in this field very recently, and I find that very astonishing, is I'm talking all the time about these astrophysical plasmas, astrophysical sources, all this sort of stuff, so one thing on a gigantic scale. I, I cannot think about how big it actually is. And I'm making connections to laser plasmas, which are on the order of like, well, a centimeter, a few centimeters, but never more. And the question is, why do we expect that these two systems have anything in common? Because they're separated by orders of magnitude, not just one, but just a lot of orders of magnitude. And the reason for that is because both of them are, are described by MHD, so magnetohydrodynamics. And the interesting bit is that Equally to regular hydrodynamics, also magnetohydrodynamics is scale invariant. So we can do some some um, similarity. Uh, well, actually, there was a picture somewhere showing them. Whatever, some uh, similarity um, substitutions, making all of these all of these parameters well, dimensionless, and then we find some dimensionless numbers which characterize the system very well. Uh, one of them is the Reynolds number, just as for hydrodynamics. And then there's another one appearing, which is the magnetic, uh, magnetic Reynolds number, which is just the same thing, just for magnetic fields. And we find that um, 
if we have two plasmas and they have similar Reynolds number and magnetic Reynolds number, then they are similar to each other. So they have like the same the same behavior, they have the same motions and, and this sort of stuff. So the only thing to do is measure these two numbers for astrophysical plasmas and just recreate them in the lab. That sounds very easy. I was told it's not, but it's possible. So that's why we can draw this, this connection. Can I ask an yes. uh, unfair devil's advocate question? Yes. Um, astrophysically, obviously, you've got gravitational effects, but you probably don't have them in a laser plasma. So no. Is, that, is, there, is it known that at a certain point the scaling doesn't work, or is there a limitation to the scaling? Or? That, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I know that most of the scaling is done by essentially just assuming that, you know, these two numbers are infinitely high, mm. because then most of the gravitational effects apparently don't really play a big role okay, anymore. Yeah, of course that's not true. Mm. I mean, they are not infinitely high for the laser plasma which was produced, like, I think this one is like 350 or so, that's not infinite. Um, I, I am not entirely sure if anyone has, well, I'm sure that someone has thought about this. But I can't give you a definite answer if there has been any work yeah. done on this or any like quantitative yeah. estimate on how big these errors are. I I don't know. That's John Luke, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's a good question, and I mean definitely something where you know someone should look into. Maybe me. I don't know. Um, then, well, yeah. That's a slide. Well, okay, we have the scale invariance. What what is it good for? Well, but something like every other scale invariance. So now we can actually benchmark codes. We can compare compare codes to actual experiments. Um, we can make experiments in some regimes which are maybe not available to codes because you know computing power isn't big enough. Um, we can do all sorts of these things which you can regularly do when we have this connection of theory, experiment and codes. So, yeah. um, one thing to, to you know keep track of is that that still doesn't mean that you know we understand everything because we're limited still by like laser power and laser power is you know not infinitely high. So you know there's there's still things to be done. But we, we, we can we can produce or apparently we can produce um, large Reynolds number large magnetic Reynolds number and get into the astrophysical significant regime. Um, well, now we come to the talk where also I'm a bit uncomfortable, but um, that's the experiment which, which, was, which was, well, conducted. Um, I thought it would be best to go through it point by point, um, more for me than for you maybe, but we'll see. Um, so just to disentangle the whole thing. These blue blue lines are, first of all, up to a tiny tweak, from here on the thing is symmetric. Um, these blue lines are laser beams, same here. Um, and these laser beams get focused on the target. This is a photo of the target, it's very small. Um, it's reproduced here. And what essentially happens is these laser beams all shine onto onto a small foil. This foil sits here. Um, so it looks like this. Well, it's a circle. Um, and what happens is, due to this rapid illumination, there is a shock wave driven in in this material. It's a very thin material, and the shock wave reaches the other side, and then there's an outburst of plasma. So there's a plasma jet appearing, um, and this plasma jet then focuses in this direction, and from this way in this direction, and it reaches these these two grids. Well, I don't know if you can really see it very well, but it's a grid, um, just a regular grid with like holes and this sort of stuff, so nothing like too fancy. And um, what this does is it forces the flow to basically break up into fingers. So suddenly there are small fingers appearing, and these then just counter-propagate and collide with each other. The trick is that the two the two grids are turned slightly so that the fingers intersect into each other and that the, the borders there are all sorts of instabilities going on and it was hoped and also shown that it actually happened that um, there are instabilities going on and reducing vorticity turbulence and all this sort of stuff so we will get a very turbulent plasma in in the middle and that can then be probed with multiple probe 
beams and so on. Um, most of them will not be interesting for this talk, also because I have no idea about them. Um, we will talk a tiny bit about this one, but we can talk about it once, once it actually comes to the point. Um, oh yeah, by the way, I mean, he already did it, but if you have questions, you know, just ask them. Um, this is a simulation of this plasma. So um, we see here the two foils. These are the grids. And um, hopefully, yes. So here's the illumination happening. The plasma jets come out. They stream through the grid. They, um, well, yeah, they, they separate up into, into these fingers. They separate up into, into these fingers. And then you can see that once they collide here, now, all this like vorticity appears, and this is a turbulent region which uh, well, we're excited about and which we're going to be talking about. Um, yes, this is again the same picture, just you know, taking a cut through it. And the the finding of this um, of this of this experiment was that um, turbulence actually happens in the in the interacting region which is great because if we want to to make a connection to Fermi acceleration then we need turbulence so that's great um, there were small seed fields produced by Biermann battery um, the way you know they knew that it was Biermann battery is by basically excluding most of the other the other mechanisms to introduce seed fields also it's not so important for now that it actually is Biermann battery but just you know we we learned what Biermann battery is, so let's make the connection. Um, and then the, the Reynolds number and magnetic Reynolds number are high enough so that we are astrophysically significant. So again, good if we want to study particle acceleration. And also this uh, amplification with turbulent dynamo action happened. It happened because we you know, find magnetic fields which are at least I think 50 times higher than the seed fields which, which were produced by Biermann battery. So there is a strong amplification. And in the end, this is a proton radiography of, um, of the, the interacting region. What a proton radiography is, is basically, you take a beam of protons, you run it through this, this region, and there are these magnetic fields which then deflect the protons. So in, in the like, spaces where you, you find loads of protons, you assume that the magnetic field was st strong and just focused them onto these spots. And where you find less, they were probably deflected <coughs> away in some complicated way of an analyzing the whole thing. But that's essentially how it works. And um, this is the reconstructed magnetic field, just you know, a scene from the proton beam. I think it goes through like this somewhere. Um, and we see that there are strong structures appearing, so there are regions of high magnetic fields, regions of slow magnetic fields. It looks quite turbulent because it just you know, looks all over the place. Um, yes, but that is, that is the magnetic field a particle would see. Um, the way, the way they, they got to this point is by basically using two species of protons. And they used one species with 15 MeV and one species with 3.3 MeV. The reason for, for that is the 15 MeV protons are slightly faster. So they reach the plasma first. They cross the plasma, they do their deflection, and they can get measured. And then the 3.3 MeV protons come along and luckily probe the same plasma because the, the difference in time is too small for like the dynamic time scales of, of this plasma so they, they, they uh, basically see the same thing but we have a second image and what has been done now is taking the image of the faster one inverting the image through some complicated algorithm to find the magnetic field and then simulating a beam of protons of 3.3 MeV protons looking at the pattern which they would produce, which is this, and comparing it to the pattern which we find. And once we find you know, like that they agree very well, then we can be fairly confident that the magnetic field we reconstructed is probably the magnetic field which is actually present. Um, now you see that these two um, look fairly similar. This is the simulated one, and this is the measured one. The structures are pretty much the same. The like, in, uh, well, proton flux in, in this case, but it's, you know, it's related to the magnetic field strength, um, is also pretty similar in both of them. Um, so that's good. The one thing to notice 
is that this one, which is the measured one, is a lot more blurred than the simulated one. And that is because, um, well, because of internal um, you know, ideas of, of, this, uh, of this diagnostics tool. Um, the proton beam which we start with, because it comes from like, an imploding capsule, is already not 100% correlated. So there is an intrinsic length, which is like the highest resolution we can get. And everything be like below that, all of the small scale fields below that, we won't probe for. Um, so they weren't included in here, but in reality, of course, they are inclu included. So this causes this blurring effect. Um, and this blurring effect actually sparked the interesting idea to measure the diffusion coefficient of the plasma directly. But we're going to talk about it if we have enough time. So it, it's actually useful. Um, now, what, what, how can you draw the line to, um, to particle acceleration? Um, in a sense, this, this is a very simple slide. The only thing you have to do is um, you have to introduce onto these foils deuterium. Because what happens then is you can create the same two plasma flows interacting with each other and you can cause fusion. You can cause two uh, deuterium atoms to fusion to a tritium and, and the protons. So you can actually create uh, protons inside of the interacting region which then propagate out and since they see a turbulent magnetic field they will be subject to particle acceleration. And uh, since we know fairly well the, the energy and the initial distribution of these pro fusion protons, we can compare that to what we actually measure and get an idea of, of how this mechanism worked, how well it worked, how strong it was, and this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, and, and that's fairly simple to do because you only have to change the, the, the foil on here. Apparently, it's fairly simple. And then you can do this experiment. And it has been demonstrated at uh, large laser facilities that this fusion process actually works um, with this experiment, which is basically the same without grids. Now, the idea is before you start and you know spend a lot of money to create some of these experiments and this sort of stuff, the idea is to get an estimate of how strong this diffusion would be and what sorts of effects we're going to talk about because if they are too small and you can't measure them in the first place it doesn't really make sense to spend, spend money. So the idea here is to find a very like very much simplified uh, like picture of the plasma, estimate the diffusion coefficient and see what sort of spectrum we get out. Um, how do we do that? Well first of all it's like Fermi, Fermi acceleration is um, stochastic acceleration, so it's in a sense a Fokker-Planck type mechanism. So we can just, you know, describe that by a diffusion equation, momentum space diffusion equation. Um, it's this one. Um, so we have the normal momentum space dif diffusion um, part. We have a loss term, which is due to the fact that particles can stream out of the plasma and then are no longer subject to momentum space diffusion, and we have this this well, yeah, seed term again, which just you know accounts for these particles appearing um, at a certain energy and time. And then we have a second uh, distribution because the detectors they all sit outside of the plasma. So the second distribution is just the distribution outside. It's just seeded by the loss term of the first one. That's it. Um, yes, and the idea is to measure this second distribution and just see how it looks. Like. In a simple way. So, what do we do? Well, we do what you know probably every like at least second year undergrad can do after you know we develop this picture. But we just look at look at the turbulent plasma and we just say, okay, the easiest thing we can see if we just macroscopically look at it, it's a bunch of vortices and this sort of stuff. So, a bunch of turbulent cells which just move around in random patterns. And we just allocate or we just you know, associate the magnetic field to each of these patterns and see what happens. Um, in that sense, we can find an estimate for the diffusion coefficient. The diffusion coefficient is just the change in energy, pitch angle averaged over some time scale for, for this change in energy. And the energy diffusion coefficient and the uh, momentum diffusion coefficient, of course, are related. Um, then we just find for this one, 
that it is due to the force that a proton just you know experiences in each of these cells. So that's just Lorentz force. Um, and we have Ohm's law um, to, to give us this electric field because so far we only have magnetic fields. Um, and it draws, it, well, I mean, it's, it's the usual Ohm's law with pressure term and hole term and this sort of stuff. We find that all of these latter ones are small for our plasma, so we just ignore them. Um, we find that the pressure is small depending on what sorts of magnetic fields you're talking about, so we'll just include it for now, but it, it could be small, but it doesn't really matter, so we include it. Can I just ask a really simple question? Yes. Uh, the forced equation that you have there doesn't have a magnetic term, is that just because the velocities are really s small, so it's just, just that says no Q V cross B. Well, ah, the the force the force here only has the electric terms because first of all the velocities are small, but also because we're talking here about the change in energy, not pitch angle uh, change. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So magnetic fields yeah. don't change in energy. Yeah. 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 Um, and then we just do that, and we find this diffusion coefficient. The actual terms are not so important. I mean, here we have the u cross b term. Here we have the grad p term. Um, the actual form of it is not so important. The only thing I wanted to say is we can find this. Um, and then the second thing we, we need to talk about is the escape time, because there were two, two parameters which go in, right? It's the diffusion coefficient and escape time. So we talk about the escape time. How do we get the escape time? Um, by looking at the diffusion and just finding a spatial diffusion coefficient and um, defining a, a time scale based on that. So by just taking the size of the system, big L, whatever the size is, over the spatial diffusion coefficient. We can find the spatial diffusion coefficient in a very similar manner as before. So we take our toy model of the plasma, we just define a, a um, um, mean free path by saying, you know, a particle has to be deflected by, by pi half or whatever angle before it, it, it counts as being scattered. This then defines a time scale and so on, and you can go through through this math. It's 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 very easy. Um, and you find this diffusion coefficient and then an escape time like this. It's worth mentioning that the escape time is uh, proportional to p to the minus three. So faster particles diffuse out a lot faster. Not only because they are faster, but a lot faster. Um, and then. Yeah, okay, we, we can talk about some, some of the values. Well, actually, there should be values here, but uh, they're not. Okay, so the experiment was, was uh, being conducted here and there, and we find values which are basically, they, they, they prove that what we did so far is correct. We, we have magnetic fields, which are fairly strong, and we have large Reynolds numbers. These two are a bit larger than these, but also on the same order of magnitude. We have turbulence and we have temperatures and this sort of stuff. So all these go in. And um, if we do that, we get a series of time scales because the last remaining question is, we're talking about diffusion, but is it actually diffusion? Because if the scattering time, for example, is longer than the escape time, then it's just ballistic escape, right? It's not really diffusion. So to, to, to make sure that we're talking about something sensitive, we calculate these times. And we find that the escape time and the scattering time, to be very honest, are very close to each other. But the dependence on the magnetic field, of course, is opposite. So if we, increase, if, if we are lucky and you know the, the lower end of the spectrum, which we expect based on, based on simulations, and we get a bit above that, these two will separate and we will probably be in the diffusive regime. Um, but that's the like first part of the part where I'm saying, well, you know, we don't know what, what's going to be expected. Now, the interesting, the interesting bit is that this diffusion uh, equation for these two diffusion coefficients, which, which we have found now, can actually be solved analytically. Um, the way the way to do that is by taking taking this diffusion coefficient. Well, I mean, it, it was done in in the, in the paper by Philip March, I think. And um, there are interesting ways of, of, of doing that. He uses some relations. But for these two specific ones, what you can do is you can take the diffusion equation, you can do a sort of like a set of uh, substitutions, and you actually find that you can reduce it to a heat equation, which we know how to solve. 
you solve it, you substitute back, and you, know, you do the whole machinery. And uh, you find a solution which looks awful, so I don't show it. But um, what comes out of it is, is, is these spectra. Um, it's all the time the same spectrum, just for, for later times. We see that the blue curve, which is the inner distribution, just reduces in size, which makes sense because the particles escape, and at some point there's nothing left. Um, and the orange curve um, also doesn't change a lot, but that also makes sense because we like the seed amount of, 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 of particles we introduce is very small, so there, there's no big change. But what, what is to be seen here is that the, the peak is at uh, 0 0.08, which is exactly the, the, the like initial energy of, of the protons which are created. But we introduce a, um, a width now, so there might be energy shift going on, and also there is a full width at half maximum, which might be interesting to, to measure. Um, and indeed, the uh, mean momentum of, of these particles does something slightly more interesting. Well, the outer one just decreases. Again, makes sense, because the first particles escape first, so you know it gets shifted towards lower particles, and at some point nothing is left anymore, so then you know they are out. And um, the outer distribution does the opposite, so it, inc it increases first, because most of the fast particles get out, so there are only like, there are more fast particles, so we have, we have a higher mean momentum, and then it decreases again when the slower ones start to fill up the whole thing. And the question to, to ask now is the difference between well, these two points. So how much did it shift? Um, and we see not by a lot. Um, and we can also calculate the full width at uh, half maximum. It's these numbers. Um, I was told that at least these can definitely be measured. This one probably not. I have to take their word. I don't know. Um, I'm just saying, in principle, it is de detectable. And um, now the thing we could talk about, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's up to you if you still want to continue talking about this, measuring this diffusion coefficient. But if you don't. We've got a few more minutes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah minutes. Okay, perfect. I mean, I don't know if people are bored. I'm going to go for the <laughs> um, uh, The. Uh, well, the, the, the basic idea to measure the diffusion coefficient is by introducing a pinhole in the same setup as before. And the, th the thing that does is, if there is no plasma, we just get a sharp image of a pinhole. But if there is plasma and there are suddenly like these, these magnetic fields going on, then um, particles which were like, perfectly aligned in the beginning start to get kicks into random random directions. So there is an introduction of momentum into like the perpendicular plane. So the whole image will get blurred. And by this blurring can then be related to the actual size of the of the diffusion coefficient. And that would give us a handle on, you know, if this toy model we, we, we had is actually valid or not or not. You know. um, the way that this would work, in a sense, is this is again the, the plasma, and this is the like, proton beam which goes through. It experiences here this this sort of magnetic field, and will then will then widen up and blur. And um, this has been done. Um, most of the analysis is still on the way. I was told to talk about it, but there is not a lot I can talk about it. Um, so this is the magnetic field again, which the particles. Uh, experience and the thing like the interesting bit is, is this one and this one um, because here these two pictures are the pinhole without plasmas for these two particle species they they uh, they use um, and then here there are these these two pictures where they have introduced the plasma and at least for this one for this one it's not so well visible but for at least for this one it's clearly visible that this one is sharp and this one is not and um, to enhance visibility what they've done is they just they've just taken the contour of it and um, I mean here it's clearly visible that the blue line is the, the pinhole size so what you see without plasma and then the, the black one and the red one are um, the sizes after after the, it, it passed the plasma so there's clearly like a blurring going on and this blurring can can then be related to to the diffusion coefficient but well yeah you can exclude all sorts of uh, effects which could also cause the blurring but not but are not actually intrinsic to, to the plasma so well 
one interesting one maybe to point out because I would have never thought of that is that um, in principle if you have all these protons bombarding this pinhole you put in this pinhole could get charged so suddenly you get blurring because your actual experiment gets charged and not because of the plasma you want to test but they've accounted for that and they've measured that and this is a small effect but I would have definitely never thought of that um, yes as I said, the analysis is still underway, so I can't, can't tell you anything about it. The paper will come out at some point. Um, just to wrap up, um, we've seen that plasmas of astrophysical relevance can be investigated by laboratory experiments due to a natural scale invariance of the governing MHD equations, very similar to normal uh, hydrodynamics equations. The universe is turbulent. Cosmic magnetic fields can be produced by the Biermann battery effect and subsequently be amplified by this twisting and stretching and folding of magnetic fields. Um, the effects can be reproduced in laser-produced plasmas, and with small adjustments, you can basically <coughs> test for the, the um, diffusion coefficient. And we've also like, made a very toy model estimate of, of what the spectrum would look like of, of the whole thing. and. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm open for questions. Any questions? You said there were two Fermi mechanisms, and this was the second order one. Yes. Is there any way that one can look at the relevance of the first one? Um, using of two? Yes, the first one. Um, people investigate the first one very frequently because the first one has a very tight connection to shock acceleration. So in a sense, you can, you can take these two magnetic mirrors which converge and just replace them by a shock and a particle always going over, over the shock back and forth. Um, there are many experiments which, which uh, are, are, are done in that field, so, so you can do that, yes. But this one was specifically to test for, for the second order process because, um, because I mean, it's second order in the velocity of the, the, the charged cloud over the actual actual particle, right? But if that is not small anymore, then the two processes don't necessarily, like one of them is not necessarily faster than the other. Any questions? Yes. Uh, so my thing is the issue originally with these ultra high energy cosmic rays, was that they, the protons can interact with the cosmic microwave background and produce ions and accelerate them. So the, the aim is this, are you really just studying the Fermi mechanism to see if it's correct and we push to higher energies or are you the aim become a novel or novel thing that can accelerate these things even higher energy than That's a good question. Um, the idea here is to understand the Fermi mechanism better. Um, if it comes out that you can actually increase the energy with this mechanism, great. But um, that's that's not the main idea. Like this still doesn't account for some of the really high energetic energetic particles. This is simply to understand the theory, basically prove it right or wrong, and, and get a better understanding. It it does not solve any of the like problems we have with ultra high high particles. Any other questions? May I just ask one quick question? Yes. Um, you said at the beginning that. The uh, universe is magnetized, and the um, magnetic field is about a femtogauss. Mm -hmm. like um, and you mentioned various mechanisms like the and battery and the turbulent dynamo. Do they then answer that question about it being a femtogauss? Is that enough? Um, no, these only account for the seed fields. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm fairly certain. Well, I mean, the seed fields then get amplified, right? So the turbulent dynamo. And that one could account for, for these femtoseconds. I know, not time to say time to go, yeah. and, and so on, magnetic fields, because in a sense the, 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 the process only terminates when the magnetic energy and like the, the you know, like fluid energy in the system is, is, is the same. Mm. And that is what we see in the universe. So it should be able to account for that. I'm not entirely sure if people have, because it has only recently been seen in the laboratory, mm. I'm not sure if people have like, made experiments specifically on that. But it should be able to account for that. Can we see in astrophysically as well? Not just in the lab, in lasers, but by you know, observing supernovas or something like this? Well, I mean, the astrophysical explanation that it is this mechanism is that this mechanism basically